Shall we go ahead and get started? Um, I would like to um, introduce our speakers today. Um, as you can see, um, the topic for today is advanced molecular diagnostics and in infectious disease. This is an area that's exploding, and I think um, uh, people in many specialties have been approached about a variety of different kinds of diagnostic tests that promise that we can make diagnoses with one drop of blood um, for any of a number of pathogens and are really trying to understand how does that really work and how do we actually apply that um, and how, um, how magical are these tests. And so I'm delighted that we have a tag team today of Ahmed Babaker and Ampien Tadosi to talk to us about that. Ahmed Babaker is currently the Medical Microbiology Fellow here um, at Emory. We are delighted that he is staying on board with us as faculty come July. He completed his Infectious Disease Fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and is interested in the future in how to apply diagnostics like this into our clinical workflow, in addition to looking at genomics of multidrug resistant organisms. Anne Piantadosi joined our faculty just this year. Um, she completed an MD-PhD at the University of Washington and then her uh, medicine training and infectious disease fellowship at Mass General Hospital. Um, and then um, uh, has delved deeply in research in metagenomic sequencing, particularly of CNS infections, um, and has done some very interesting work in that area. And so we were thrilled to have her join faculty here. So they are the perfect two people to talk to us about this topic. And so without further delay, let me introduce Dr. Babaker. Thank you very much. All right, I'm very pleased uh, to be here talking about a uh, topic that's dear to my heart and with uh, Dr. Piantadosi. Um, we have no conflict of interest to announce. Um, so just to kind of walk us through some of the things that we'll be talking about. So we'll start off with uh, kind of a primer on PCR just to make sure that we're all on the same page. And then we'll level up and talk about multiplex PCR testing. And from there, we'll level up again to talk briefly about 16S and then uh, sort of the big beast, which is metagenomic sequencing itself. Um, but first, to put things into perspective, we'll kind of walk through a published case in the literature. Um, so this is a 75-year-old man who has a two-week history of gradual onset confusion and speech difficulties. His past medical history is pertinent for follicular lymphoma, um, status post uh, a few rounds of chemotherapy, and he's on rituximab. Um, he's originally from Vietnam, but immigrated many, many, many years ago to uh, the best coast, which is California. Um, on examination, he was disoriented to time and place. Um, he had no focal neurological deficits. Um, the MRI was within normal, but his CSF showed a significant pleocytosis, as you can see, predominantly neutrophils, um, and the protein was very elevated, 587, and uh, glucose was also on the low side. Um, and so I hope this works. Okay. So this doesn't, didn't work, but you know, if um, I wanted maybe some people to kind of share some differentials with some of the information that they had, um, but I think for the sake of time, we'll just kind of move on. But if you guys kind of keep in mind what are some of the differentials you guys might think of when a patient like this appears um, on your hospital doorsteps. Um, so further testing was done um, and the patient had uh, blood cultures which were negative, um, CSF cultures which were negative, um, and then they also had a film array biomeningitis uh, meningoencephalitis panel positive for HSV1. Um, and then the patient was started on IVA cycle here. And so you may be thinking to yourself, um, or maybe not because you're part of this audience, but you may be thinking to yourself, what is the film array meningoencephalitis panel? Um, and it is a form of multiplex PCR testing, and it's a test that's offered um, on this platform. Um, but before talking about that, we'll take a step back and talk about PCR testing. Um, and so just to kind of walk us through uh, PCR testing and the technology, um, let's, for example, say that you have a serum sample that you want to test for EBV. So you take your sample, um, and then you do um, an extraction step where you try and extract some of the nucleic acid from your sample. Um, and this is usually takes about, let's say, about an hour. You then take your sample, um, and now it has all the extracted nucleic acid. And you specifically want to see if your sample has EBV DNA. And so you add to your sample some primers that have been manufactured, which are very specific to a certain gene within the EBV DNA sequence. 
And with it, you have a probe that fluoresces, which is also specific to your sequence. And then you heat it up, um, allowing the complementary strands of the EBV DNA to separate. And then you add, um, and you would have already added your DNA polymerase, which then allows the primers to be extended um, and displaces the probes, causing amplification. So now instead of the one copy of EBV, now we have two copies and so on and so forth. This goes on through multiple cycles and now we've amplified, if the EBV DNA was present, now we've amplified it. And with the multiple steps of amplification and every time the DNA polymerase displaces the probe, um, we have a detection, uh, we can detect this fluorescent signal from the unbound probe and then our test sort of flags positive. So how does multiplex PCR differ from PCR as we've walked through it? So instead of the one target, such as the specific EBV DNA target, we have multiple targets, um, and that's kind of why it's called multiplex. And so just kind of to take a step back, we have the EBV DNA, but in our and then we have the primers, which match the EBV uh, DNA sequence. But instead in the multiplex model, instead of having the one primer, which matches our specific target, we have multiple organisms that we're trying to target. So for example, instead of just EBV, now we have CMV, HSV1, HSV2. And so we have multiple primers which can target those multiple organisms. Um, and really, the really powerful um, part of this technology is that people have taken what is a sort of multi-step process and made it into a one-stop shop. And so with some of these multiplex PCR panels, everything is done, um, all this uh, sample preparation is done in just a few minutes. As you can see here, you take your primary sample, which can be CSF, for example, or blood or sputum, and you load it into this pouch. You put a bit of hydration, um, and then you put it into your machine, and within an hour, you can have the results of your PCR panel. <clears throat> and so what the manufacturers have decided is that um, these multiple targets should be binned into syndromic uh, panels. Um, <clears throat> And so just some examples of some of these panels and what is uh, offered on some of these panels. So for example, we have the gastrointestinal panel. And the gastrointestinal panel contains a multitude of bacteria, um, some parasites, some viruses, which all cause diarrhea. If we look at the respiratory panel, um, again, we have uh, a number of bacteria, some atypical bacteria, some regular bacteria, some viruses, um, plus minus some antimicrobial resistance genes, and all of these are sort of your, what could be causing a pneumonia um, pathogen. The same goes with meningoencephalitis. Um, we have your sort of garden variety meningitis bacteria organisms. You have some viruses and you have cryptococcus. And the bacteria panel, which I think a lot of manufacturers are bringing forward, has a plethora again of gram positive, gram negative, some antibiotic resistance genes, and some of them even have yeast. And these examples that I've showed are the biofire panels, but there's different um, companies which have different targets, but they're all kind of the same concept. And so of course, um, it's very clear that with these sort of panels and with this testing, um, you can have very, very fast results. So from time of collection sample, uh, if you can get it to the lab, you can maybe have your results within an hour, hour and a half. Um, and with these, very quick turnaround times, not only is it quick in terms of um, getting the answer, but it's also quick in terms of the tech time in the lab. And so with these quick turnaround times, um, we have decreased length of stay, um, potentially, and um, lots of opportunities for de-escalation. So once you have your answers, you have somebody that you've started on broad spectrum antibiotics, maybe you can start to peel back once you have some of these answers. Um, and the other great thing is that there isn't any specific a priori knowledge or suspicion needed. So maybe you have a patient that you know has pneumonia, but you don't necessarily know what pneumonia they have. Do they have viral pneumonia? Do they have bacterial pneumonia? Do they have an atypical pathogen? Um, and not only that, but you don't need to know exactly how we need to test. So as long as you can sort of bend your patient into the right clinical context, then you can potentially get the answer. So just coming back onto our case um, to kind of wrap things up. So unfortunately, despite a cyclovir uh, being started pretty quickly, the patient continued to uh, deteriorate while he was inpatient. Um, a repeat MRI 
which if you remember initially was normal, now showed an evolving hydrocephalus. So he was transferred to a tertiary referral center. And at that time, uh, the ID team was consulted. And so the ID team requested some additional testing, which included HSV1 and 2 PCRs, BZV PCR, CMV PCR, and a cryptococcal CSF antigen. Um, and all of these were negative. Um, what did turn out to be positive seven days later on his hospitalization was an MTB PCR test. Um, and then later on, the CSF, which had initially been sent for AFB culture, grew positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis. And so the authors concluded that this was a case that um, led to a delayed diagnosis um, of uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis due to the initial false positive on the HSV PCR panel. Um, and so you may be thinking, well, you know, how often does, it, does, um, does this false positive happen? And, you know, why did this happen? And so we'll kind of talk about maybe why this happened and what are some ways that we can think about multiplex testings to ensure the best outcomes for our patient. So I think the first, the first way or the first step is really thinking um, at the pre-analytical phase is who is the right patient? So if you order the wrong test for the right patient and get the wrong answer, or, or vice versa, you know, you still, you still have the wrong answer. Um, and so just as an example, during our flu season, um, that's, you know, from December to April, about 20 up to 40% of all, all of our RVPs are positive for influenza. So if you're in the middle of a bad, bad flu season, is your multiplex panel really the right test to order for your patient? Or should you be doing targeted testing for flu because your pretest probability is so high? Additionally, if you have an inpatient on broad spectrum antibiotics who develops acute onset diarrhea, again, is your multiplex panel really the right test for this patient? Do you really need to be thinking about cryptosporidium um, and norovirus? Or is targeted C diff PCR testing you know, the way to go? And so sort of coming back onto our initial patient, this patient had a two week history of um, gradual onset symptoms. So was the meningoencephalitis panel really the right test to order in this case? Um, probably not. Hindsight is 2020, but all of the pathogens on that panel are more sort of acute, um, acute pathogens and wouldn't be causing the smoldering infection over two weeks. Again, so now that you've ordered the test and you have the result back, does the test make, make sense? Um, I'm sure you guys have all heard, uh, treat the patient, not the test, but I think in the molecular era, this is even more uh, appropriate to think of. So going again back to our patients, you know, did the CSF parameters really fit with an HSV-1 um, uh, infection? Um, you know, I can make the argument that probably it did not. And again, the patient did have what we now clearly see as epidemiological risk factors and clinical risk factors with his recent immunosuppression for having tuberculosis. Um, again, um, number three is staying vigilant for pathogens outside of the panel. So again, the meningoencephalitis panel did not have uh, tuberculosis. And at this point, these tests should be an adjunct to our routine testing um, in case of you know, cases like these, or even just getting routine susceptibility. Um, the meningoencephalitis panel doesn't have any healthcare associated pathogens. And as we learned from the case, doesn't have TB. And here at our um, institution, patients that had the meningoencephalitis panel ran also had a variety of other pathogens. And so if we had only limited ourselves to this narrow uh, testing, then there's a variety of organisms ranging from Staph aureus to West Nile virus to EBV um, to Candida that we would have missed. Um, and so lastly, I think uh, when thinking about ordering these for your patient or thinking even uh, after you order them about interpreting them, really involving you know, the infectious disease folk um, and us in the micro lab to help uh, sort of coordinate the testing and pick what may be, uh, maybe even offer alternative testing that may be more targeted and higher yield. So moving on to 16S PCR sequencing. So first of all, what is 16S? Um, so the 16S uh, stands for 16S ribosomal RNA. And this is a component of the 30S small subunit of prokaryotic ribosomes. And why we do 16S uh, sequencing is because the 16S RNA is highly conserved between um, different species of bacteria. But within the 16S, we have uh, hypervariable regions that can provide specific species-specific uh, signature sequences useful for identification. 
Um, and so what I mean is that once we have uh, taken out our uh, nucleic acid, we have a conserved sequence and a hypervariable sequence. And the hypervariable sequence is very species specific. And so because we have this conserved sequence, we can then create primers that match the conserved sequence um, and amplify our rRNA. And then using the hypervariable sequence, um, get the answer to what our species is. And so the way I think of it is kind of like a barcode. A barcode is always present on your, um, on your mac and cheese. Um, but when you scan it, it'll tell you that it's, you know, Kraft or Anne's mac and cheese. Um, and so when do we use 16S uh, sequencing? Typically, uh, we use it if we have a culture negative um, infection. So if we have a high suspicion for infection, um, for example, in somebody that has infective enterocarditis, um, but all the cultures are negative and we have a, a, a valve that's been removed that shows evidence of infection, this may be the right place to order 16S sequencing. Or if we have a zebra that, um, you know, it's a bacteria that's growing in the lab but isn't cooperating well for some reason, this also may be an opportunity for us to use 16S uh, sequencing. So some important things to know about 16S though is that it is a ribosomal RNA that's a component of the prokaryotic uh, ribosome. So it's not going to be present in your eukaryotic organisms such as fungi and parasites. So if those are the things that you're looking for, you need to do different sort of testing. And so for fungi, we have 18S, 28S, and ITS. Um, and generally, we can do it on tissue. Um, so if you have a path specimen, it can be run on the path specimen or directly on from an isolate to identify said isolate. And so with that, I'll pass it on to Anne to talk about metagenomic sequencing. All right, you guys ready for the big dragon? <laughs> So thanks very much for the invitation to speak um, and for all of you for attending today. And thanks to Babaker for an awesome setup uh, for this part of the talk. So um, I'm gonna talk about some of the best aspects of metagenomic sequencing first, and I'm gonna do it with a case that I think really highlights all that this technique has to offer. Um, this was a patient that I saw back when I was in Boston um, in uh, 2017, and um, it was in the fall. So just kind of set the stage uh, for you guys there. And um, he was a 61-year-old man with Crohn's disease who was treated with adalimumab. So he was a bit immunosuppressed, came in with headache and confusion, had a pleocytosis that was lymphocyte predominant, had an elevated protein, and had a glucose that was a little bit low. His MRI was notable for really marked sulcal T2 hyperintensities, as well as hyperintensities in the thalami and cerebellum, as shown here. And at this point, sort of as Babaker alluded to, this syndrome and presentation really could have been due to any number of things. Um, in fact, it could have been due to at least this many number of things. Um, and this is a schematic showing you all of the tests that were sent by the clinical team for this patient. And so on the x-axis, I'm showing you the hospital day, and each one of these bars is a different clinical test that was individually thought of, individually ordered, and individually sent. And the beginning of each bar is the hospital day on which the test was ordered, and the end of the, each bar is the hospital day on which the results returned. And so you can see that some things were really tested quickly and returned negative, like herpes simplex virus, HSV, or enterovirus EV, um, we have PCR tests for those and those came back negative pretty quickly. Other things like Bardinella, rabies, JC virus were also ordered and really took quite a bit longer for the test results to come back. Um, but for this patient, everything was coming back negative and actually on hospital day 11, he ended up undergoing a brain biopsy. And this showed some inflammation, um, and again, a multitude of tests staining for specific organisms were sent from this, and all of those came back negative as well. And um, I'm showing you this just kind of one representative case, but I think any of us who've taken care of patients with encephalitis will recognize um, these challenges and recognize this type of presentation, um, where I think central nervous system infections are really one of the most challenging syndromes that, that we deal with. And this is because patients have really high morbidity and high mortality. As an infectious disease clinician, it can be really frustrating because infectious and non-infectious etiologies can appear clinically similar, in fact, to the point of being indistinguishable. 
And in about half of patients, after all of their workup is done, there's no identified etiology. Um, but this is not because we don't try. So I know many of you are ID physicians or at least know some ID physicians, and you'll know that we love sending tests. So we love the individual PCRs, the multiplex PCRs, all that stuff. Um, and in fact, our society guidelines suggest more than 20 possible tests just for viruses, just for patients with encephalitis. And that places a lot of cognitive burden on us to figure out which tests we want to send, what type of test it is, whether it be PCR, serology, or how to send it. Um, and in addition to all of that work, it's really expensive. So testing for patients with encephalitis has been estimated to cost about $10,000 per patient including invasive tests like the brain biopsy that our patient had. So when you look at all of this together, you find yourself really wishing for a magic bullet. You find yourself wishing for one test that could sort of solve all of this at once. And what I'm going to tell you is that metagenomic sequencing sort of is that test, not really. But in this case, it served the purpose. So um, we were running a study of metagenomic sequencing in patients with CNS infection. And here on hospital day eight, the patient enrolled in our study. Um, and over the next four and a half days, we were able to obtain some results. And so it took us about three days to prepare the sample, including extracting the nucleic acid and con constructing sequencing libraries. It took about one day for the sequencing machine to do its magic. And then it took us about half a day to do the data analysis, which includes this mystical metagenomic analysis that I'll come back to, and then also a confirmatory virus-specific analysis, because we ended up, what we ended up finding was Powassan virus. And um, I don't know if you're as excited about this result as we were, um, but this was an unusual pathogen for us to be detecting, but really plausible for, for this patient's case. So at that point, we kind of just anxiously awaited the clinical confirmatory test, which was a serology test that gets sent to the CDC. Um, and it turned out that that ended up being positive, confirming our findings, um, but it took the results, it took about four weeks for the results to return. So you're probably asking yourself two questions now. One is what is Powassan virus? And one is what is metagenomic sequencing? And so the second question will be the, the rest of the talk. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about Powassan virus because it's my favorite virus. Um, it's a flavivirus like West Nile. But unlike West Nile, which is transmitted by mosquitoes, Powassan virus is transmitted by ticks. And in fact, it's transmitted by Ixodes scapularis, which is the same vector that transmits Borrelia, the causative agent of Lyme disease as well as anaplasma and babesia. So it's a really important vector for human diseases. And Powassan virus has really been increasingly detected and recognized as an important pathogen. And you can just see here the drastic increase in number of cases over the decades kind of leading up until now. And so this really emphasizes what a perfect scenario this was for metagenomic sequencing. It was a test that is hard to think of in order it was a disease that's hard to think of and order the test for a priori. If you do order, it takes a long time to get the results back, and it's common enough that your chances of, of picking it up aren't bad. All right, so then that brings us to what is metagenomic sequencing. And this, you know, I think people use the term metagenomic in a couple of different ways, um, and people actually use the term meta in a couple of different ways, so I want to be a little bit careful about the definition here and tell you that I think of metagenomic sequencing in the same way that we think about sort of metaphysics. And so this is a use that is supposed to be kind of all encompassing, even transcendent. And so it's something that really emphasizes not just genome sequencing, but sequencing all genomes, all the genomes. And um, people also refer to metagenomic sequencing as shotgun sequencing, which I think is fine, but maybe a little bit less philosophical. Um, and they also refer to it as whole genome sequencing, which I think is a bit misleading because you're not just sequencing one whole genome, you're really trying to capture everything. And to understand how this works, um, you first really need to understand how next generation sequencing works or NGS. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with this, um, the way that, that this is structured, it actually allows you to sequence multiple DNA fragments at once using a massively parallel platform. And so here you take a sample as an input library. Back in the good old days, you'd have to sequence kind of one piece of DNA at a time, but now you can do millions. You put them onto a structure called a flow cell, which is what leads to this massively parallel structure. You do a little bit of PCR amplification there to generate something called a cluster. 
And then you do your sequencing chemistry where every time that you sequence a particular base, you get fluorescence of a particular color. And when you look at the whole flow cell as a whole, you get these kind of beautiful patterns of colors lighting up across the flow cell. And each one of those colors represents one cluster, which in turn is derived from one molecule in your input library. So really in one process, you're able to sequence millions and millions of DNA fragments at once. And the thing about this that would make it metagenomic has to do with what you put in as the input, and it has to do with what you take out and how you analyze the data afterwards. So first of all, what do you put in? So it's pretty easy, you just put in everything. So here you take your clinical specimen, it's composed of host, normal microbiota, and potential pathogens. You extract and purify all the nucleic acid, similar to what Babaker showed you, but instead of targeting with primers or anything else, you just take this entire mixture. You've got genomes, host, contaminating nucleic acid, you've got DNA, you've got RNA, that whole mixture gets made into these sequencing libraries. And so these are the little libraries that I showed you before that go onto the sequencing machine. And once you do that, then you get your output. And here on the output, each one of those fragments gets turned into a sequencing read. And so again, now you have kind of everything represented here, including the host, the normal microbes, the contaminants, and any pathogens that you might be interested. And so this is really kind of where the tricky part arises, is taking these reads and analyzing them. Um, and there's a lot of different computational techniques to be able to do this, and it's a really kind of hotly evolving field. But they all operate under kind of the same principles, which is first to kind of isolate out the host reads. It's pretty easy to find the human reads. And then to take the rest of the reads and really try to figure out what species are making those up and which ones of them are pathogenic. And I have that on an even simplified version here. Uh, for those of you who didn't kind of follow along, you basically take the mixture of DNA or RNA, sequence all of it, and then identify the potential pathogens. At the same time, you get host, and at the same time, you get a bunch of other stuff, which can include normal microbes and can include contaminants. And that's gonna be a really important point that we come back to in a minute. So people kind of say this is like looking for a needle in a haystack, but I think it's actually quite a bit harder than that because you're not really sure if there is a needle in the haystack. And if there's not a needle in the haystack, you'd like to be able to say that with a lot of certainty. And so, you know, there are definite kind of benefits as my first case illustrated. I mentioned that it reduces the cognitive burden on clinicians to think of all the possibilities ahead of time. As I showed, it can be faster than some conventional tests like serology. And in certain patients, it can actually have increased sensitivity to something like serology. And we're seeing that more and more with patients on B-cell depleting ther therapy like rituximab. Altogether, this allows, to, allows the opportunity to spare unnecessary empiric treatments, to spare potential invasive tests, and provides a psychological benefit of diagnosis, not just to the patient or their family, but also to the many, many clinicians who are out there searching really hard for, for what's going on. And what I think is really exciting is it also allows the detection of novel pathogens, and it can provide free information about pathogenomics about pathogen genomics for research. And as a researcher, this is something that I find really exciting. Um, and of course, I say free. It's not really free. It's a very expensive test. But in the end, you get back not just your identification, but you also get back a lot of data about that organism as well. So it's been really successful in the context of central nervous system infection. It's been shown to be able to recognize pathogens belonging to different kingdoms. It's been able to reveal the importance of underappreciated pathogens. And as I mentioned, it's even been shown to identify completely novel pathogens. And the central nervous system infection space is really where a lot of this work has been done so far, um, but we're starting to see more and more evidence from other settings as well. And that includes prosthetic joint infections, which is another clinical syndrome that's really hard to diagnose. Um, uveitis, where there may be a lot of kind of unrecognized infection. And then also uh, something called a liquid biopsy, which offers the opportunity to diagnose infection anywhere in the body by looking for the pathogen nucleic acid in the bloodstream. And then of course, I you know, probably don't need to mention this too much, but it was also really instrumental in the recent discovery of the 2019 novel coronavirus. And so multiple groups of researchers used metagenomic sequencing to not just identify that virus, but to actually sequence its complete genome, which has had really important pub 
public health implications in terms of understanding where it came from and how it's spreading. So this is a technique that's really at the forefront, both clinically and in terms of research. But it's not perfect. And in fact, there are at least two ways to be wrong. There's probably lots more than two ways to be wrong, but in the interest of time, I've just kind of picked the top two here. Um, and to illustrate the first one, I'm gonna show you a different case. And no, this is not the same guy again, even though he's that same figure. Um, this was a different patient. It was actually a couple years previously in 2016. And he was a 19 year old man who came in with right-sided weakness and seizures. He was found to have a brain mass by MRI. He had an initial biopsy of this, which suggested lymphoma. And he received treatment for lymphoma, but actually had clinical deterioration requiring a second brain biopsy. That second biopsy underwent metagenomic sequencing, and the finding was a bacteria called Elizabeth Kingia. And I don't know if you guys remember this from a couple of years ago. This is a bacteria that was associated with an outbreak of bacteremia infection, uh, largely in Wisconsin. It was in immunocompromised patients, and it's a pretty highly drug-resistant bacteria um, that captured a lot of attention at the time. But it was a little bit unusual to be found in this clinical setting. And so the authors of the paper kind of reported it as indeterminate pathogen identification. This is actually one of my favorite things in the metagenomic sequencing uh, literature. So this is a table. You guys do not have to look at the details of this, but I just want to use this to illustrate a point. So they studied 10 patients, and they kind of tabulated the results. And they said they found things like JC polyomavirus and tuberculosis. And for this Elizabeth Kingia patient, they actually said Elizabeth Kingia question mark. And as a researcher, that's really reassuring to me to know that if you have an uncertain finding, you can still publish it and just stick a question mark on the end. Um, but I think it was really the right thing to do and sort of applaud them for um, showing this uncertainty because in the end, I think this um, pretty convincingly turned out to be contamination. So in a follow-up study two years later, um, there was a different group that was performing a systematic investigation of patients with chronic meningitis. And they did something that other groups really hadn't done before, which was to make really extensive use of negative controls. So they sequenced 24 water samples and 94 CSF samples from uninfected patients and used this to sort of generate a distribution of what sort of microbes you might see in your background. They ended up finding over 4,000 different genera of organisms in the negative controls. And that ranged from bacteria to viruses to eukaryotes. So really, really a lot that's out there in supposedly sterile um, solutions. They did end up seeing Elizabeth Kingia among those organisms in the negative controls. And they went back to the data from the first case and used a statistical test to compare the level of Elizabeth Kingia in that patient to the distribution that they see in their negative controls. And they actually found that there was no more Elizabeth Kingia there than would be expected from background. And so that really illustrates that you can be easily misled by metagenomic sequencing if you're not extremely rigorous about your negative controls. And just to take a step back, I know you guys are probably wondering about those 4,000 organisms, um, and they provided a table here of the most common ones. I just want to draw a couple things to your attention. One of them was propionibacterium, bacterium, which probably, as you can imagine, was derived from patient skin. One of them was Escherichia, which, as you might be able to uh, imagine, was derived from reagents because we use E. coli to grow a lot of, uh, develop a lot of enzymes and other reagents. And one of them was Pseudomonas, which is found in a lot of different water sources. And so all of those could be plausible human pathogens, and it really creates this extreme importance of understanding what's in your negative controls and whether what you're seeing is different or at a higher level um, from background. So that's the first way to be wrong, which is to mistake a piece of hay for a needle. And that really has to do with the specificity of this test and making sure that what you're reporting is accurate. Um, the other way to be wrong, of course, is has to do with sensitivity. And for this, I think you can go wrong if you only look for needles. Um, and to explain what I mean by that, you really have to think about what are the needles and what is the hay in this analogy. And what they are are different fragments of nucleic acid. Like I showed you at the beginning, the DNA or the RNA that's kind of floating around from the host and from other background compared to the DNA or RNA that's from the pathogen. And I think that really kind of gets at the heart of the essential limitation of metagenomic sequencing, which is that it only detects nucleic acid. And that's something that's really, really key to keep in mind whenever you're going to be using this test, 
And this leads to a couple of very specific situations in which the test will be negative. And the first is that metagenomic sequencing will not detect infections with short periods of viremia. And a really classic example of this is West Nile infection in immunocompetent patients. So what we think happens is a person gets infected, the virus replicates for a short period of time, and then disappears from both the blood and the cerebrospinal fluid. And if you look by PCR, or if you look by metagenomic sequencing, or any kind of molecular test, you're really never going to be able to find West Nile virus in those fluids um, at the molecular level. You will find antibodies to it, which is why we use West Nile serology as sort of the clinical diagnostic of choice. The other thing that you're going to miss is parainfectious syndromes, so situations in which the disease might have been incited by an infectious organism, but what you're really seeing are the sequelae from antibodies or autoimmunity. And some examples of that where us and others have looked for these organisms by metagenomic sequencing and not found them are things like mycoplasma encephalitis and varicella zoster, certain CNS diseases like vasculitis are really thought to be primarily antibody mediated. So you can see once all you want in these situations and it's really not going to help you. You have to be thinking of kind of orthogonal testing to do at the same time, which I think the key one here is serology. So circling back to kind of a broader picture of limitations of metagenomic sequencing, I mentioned earlier that it kind of reduces the cognitive burden on clinicians to think of stuff up front, but it actually increases the cognitive burden on clinicians to interpret the results. So as the Elizabeth Kenia uh, example shows, you first have to ask yourself, is what I'm finding here really in the patient? If it is in the patient, is it causing the patient's disease? So you're gonna find a lot of things um, by this technique that may be either innocent bystanders, you may get reactivation. For example, we saw reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus. You may pick up kind of normal microbiota, depending on what um, anatomical compartment you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time as you're interpreting your positive results, you also have to be thinking, what could we be missing due to limitations of the technique? And really keeping in mind, it's only a test for nucleic acid. I think the way to get around this is to work with a reputable metagenomic sequencing group. And it takes a lot of cross-disciplinary interaction between physicians, the clinical micro lab, and even bioinformaticians. And UCSF has a group that sort of approaches this in a clinical sequencing um, uh, almost like a tumor board where they meet and kind of review the results of the tests, which I think is, is really helpful. Um, here, if you're ever faced with results from metagenomic sequencing where you want to send the test, I'm pretty sure you're just supposed to ask Bobaker, right? <laughs> um, but really, I think asking for assistance in these situations is key. Um, and I know we're all really used to kind of dealing with uncertainty and having to interpret results, and, and we think about that a lot as sort of medicine physicians. Um, but in this case, I think it might actually be even better to start thinking like a radiologist, which is to say, you're looking at an image, you're looking at something that's completely unique to what you've seen before. You have to pull out what all sort of the pertinent positives may be. You have to decide what's an incidentaloma compared to something that's important. And there's really kind of no, um, nothing better than experience in looking at a lot of these studies and, and thinking about this a lot. Um, so that's kind of how I would suggest approaching metagenomic sequencing results. And it really is something that we're all gonna have to be doing more and more. Um, there are clinical metagenomic sequencing tests currently available through several academic groups and companies. Um, and I don't wanna endorse any of them in particular here, but I'm listing groups that you've probably heard of and that have a pretty decent um, publication track record. All of these groups um, conduct the tests in CLIA certified laboratories, and they've conducted validation studies. Um, but I would keep in mind that each, each group or each kind of platform tends to focus on one specific syndrome at a time, and they tend, uh, some of them not, don't do both DNA and RNA, but may only do one. So this group at UCSF has really kind of led the way in central nervous system infections. Um, Carius is the group that I showed the publication before on the liquid biopsy, where they try to detect any site of infection um, with circulating DNA in the bloodstream. They only detect DNA, so for RNA viruses, you're not going to be able to use that service. Um, and then ID by DNA is a group that um, has validated a test for respiratory specimens uh, that works for both RNA and DNA. <clears throat> 
And really none of these are FDA approved. Um, and all, for all of them, you really do need assistance and kind of approval going through the micro lab to make sure that you are sending the right tests for the right patient. So kind of finally, what do I think about the future of clinical metagenomic sequencing? So at the moment, I think the way that we're all sort of employing this is we're using it as a last result in patients who have unexplained symptoms after they've had an extensive infectious and even non-infectious workup. And what that means is that then we're using these kind of residual samples that may be of lower quality, they've been freeze-thawed a bunch and used for a bunch of other tests. And it means that we may be kind of pre-selecting patients who have a lower pretest probability of infection to begin with. So when you kind of see across the board, metagenomic sequencing is really good at finding stuff when we know it's there. Um, but when you apply it in all these unknown patients, it actually has a pretty low hit rate. And so instead, maybe we can imagine a future where it's used as a frontline test, um, where maybe it would replace the standard PCR tests and even replace the multiplex PCR tests. And at the same time as you were testing for these common and routine things, you might be able to identify zebras with very limited extensive workup. And of course, employing, employing it earlier on would allow you to work with better specimen quality. But I think what kind of this decision making is ulti ultimately gonna come down to is whether or not it's a cost effective test. And so some of the platforms that I mentioned are currently offering tests within the range of 500 to $2,000 which is very expensive for one individual test. Um, but the counter argument is that you have to take that in the context of the patient's entire hospitalization. So what might you be saving in terms of invasive procedures, empiric treatments, or even length of stay? Um, and I think the jury is really still out on, on all these questions. Nevertheless, um, it, the idea of metagenomic sequencing is out uh, in the public eye. This is an article from the New York Times just from the end of February. Um, new, genomic tests aimed, new genomic tests aimed to diagnose deadly infections faster. And I think this was a pretty fair um, article, fairly written, um, but I can only imagine patients that have you know, mysterious syndromes or no family members with mysterious syndromes are gonna see this article or see articles like it and really start inquiring and requesting these tests. So I think it's something to really kind of be prepared for, um, both in our own minds and to be able to talk to patients about. So the way that I would summarize thinking about metagenomic sequencing is that it's a powerful, relatively unbiased approach to detect pathogen nucleic acid, and remember nucleic acid only. It's increasingly being used in clinical settings, but there are significant areas of uncertainty, including how to integrate metagenomic sequencing services, clinical laboratories, and clinicians to not only pick who to send the test in, but to appropriately interpret the results. And then really critically, I think there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of how, when, and in whom to most effectively deploy the test. So I'll stop there, and we'd both like to thank Colleen Kraft and Wendy Armstrong for the invitation to give this presentation, um, and we're certainly happy to take questions and have some time for discussion. In the back. such as, thank you, John, um, able, allowing us to better, you know, decrease empiric antibiotics for things that are less likely. Um, but for example, in the Powassan virus, your favorite virus, um, case where unlike other things like Lyme's disease and Rocky Mountain spot spotted fever, there's not really like an, a specific treatment and it would really be supportive care. Um, when you have these big sequences that have a lot of additional viruses and like you said, needles in haystacks that they're searching for. And when a lot of those things are things that we don't yet have treatment for, and all of those would just result in supportive care regardless. Um, I guess my thought is, is there any way to kind of uh, standardize or, or specify that, hey, I want to look for things that I know might actually affect my management? Are there any sequences that specifically identify viruses or bacteria or whatever it is that 
will alter our antibiotic choices or will alter the decisions that we actually make and exclude those other needles in the haystack that will not have any effect on management and all we'll end up with is a you know fancy virus name to give the family at the end of the day yeah that's a terrific question so thank you um First, I don't want to discount the value in giving the family a fancy virus name. Um, it actually is hugely re reassuring to people to have a diagnosis um, and to have a name for something. So I, I think that is a benefit. Now, whether that's a benefit worthy of spending all that time and money, I think is a, a debate you could have. Um, but if you really wanted to focus on treatable things, I think that's where um, some of the tests that Babaker alluded to, so 16S, um, fungal uh, ITS sequencing, those exclusively, there is such a panel of those for everything except for viruses. So you could kind of focus on first sending the 16S and the ITS to look for treatable bacteria and fungi, maybe incorporating some form of kind of multiplex or individual PCR for treatable viruses like HSV, and then really kind of backburnering the metagenomic sequencing. That's kind of how we're approaching it right now. Um, but I think kind of as time goes on, it, it's going to be in really interesting to figure out whether just shotgun sequencing everything at once actually ends up being more cost effective and time effective than kind of taking this, this piecemeal approach. I have a question for Babaker. Um, so if you want to head to the microphone, if I could put you on the spot, um, we're all thinking about coronavirus right now and um, molecular diagnosis of that and availability of diagnostics for it. Can you uh, give us an update on what efforts are being made within Emory Healthcare toward that end? Sure, we're currently uh, validating the RT-PCR, uh, which is the same PCR which has been, um, which the CDC are using. So we currently have all the ingredients, and we are just uh, doing validation runs. Uh, we have four runs planned. Uh, the first one, uh, we did the, so we're like halfway through. So maybe, I know it's three, four days, but that's just the validation. And, you know, there's a lot of other things that go into it, but the validation should be done by the end of the week. I hate to say this sitting behind Nate's spell, but why are you so worried about the costs? Five hundred to two thousand dollars sounds pretty cheap to me, and given what a CT or a PET scan costs, and I guess it's going to get cheaper. So, how does that compare to uh, you know species-specific PCRs that you order if you order three or four of those? Yeah, I'll let Bobaker comment, but I think those are dollars to what's you, you know better than I do few dollars. The, um, one of the challenges um, at the moment is the lack of FDA approval for metagenomic sequencing, knowing, meaning that there's no billing code for it, and so it ends up being incorporated into the entire hospitalization cost, which I agree with you. If you can end up sparing somebody, you know, empiric antibiotics or spare them a brain biopsy certainly would overcome that. Um, but when you think about applying it on a population level, you're, you're going to be sending a lot of negative tests for every positive test, and so it's not just you know, five hundred or two thousand dollars, and you diagnose everybody. It's you know, employing it kind of on a population level starts starts to be expensive. I'll also just add that at least uh, the experience so far with the multiplex testing, it's shown that uh, people are not good stewards of the test, so people don't test appropriately. And then when they have the test results back, they don't usually um, react to the test in a in a way that decreases costs or improves outcomes unless there is like um, Anne was saying there's some sort of guidance given so whether that be a tumor like board which is kind of like a diagnostic board or even just in terms of the these multiplex panels having uh, like an infectious diseases clinical micro collaboration team which calls people uh, with the results in a timely manner and helps them decipher uh, you know some of the uh, results and, and what that means for the patient and what are some appropriate treatment options that people can use. So related to what you were just addressing, what do you see as a realistic timeline to when metagenomic sequencing might be done in-house? Is it what are is it the hurdles of FDA approval? Is it these, you know, monitoring boards? Is it the technology? What else? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's all of those things. Um, and I think a lot of it is kind of the validation. So even getting back
coronavirus um, question. Whenever you kind of roll out a new test, you need to validate it. And metagenomic sequencing is really hard because you need to validate it for any possible thing you're, you're going to find. And groups have kind of undertaken that in different ways. Um, but it's definitely a time consuming and sort of expensive process to go through that validation. Um, you know, it's interesting, some of these groups and companies are, are trying to kind of put their tests and analysis platforms into a little bit more of a box that could be just kind of picked up and used by anybody, which I think is a pretty cool um, approach. But again, you would have to go through kind of the site-specific lab validation process. All right, if no other questions, then thank you very much.